Good morning, everybody. God loves you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Pastor Ken is out uh, for a couple of days, and I have the privilege and honor to bring you God's word this morning. And um, I'm going to have to ask you to listen carefully. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today. So, today we're going to take some time to understand who this Jesus is that we serve and follow. We often see a focus on the New Testament and even an avoidance of the Old Testament. It's almost like people think somehow God changed when he sent Jesus, and Jesus replaced the God of the Old Testament, providing different standards. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, it says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This is happening in our time right now. Teachers and preachers are preaching only what people want to hear, not the full truth and the full canon of Scripture. This is leading to a skewed understanding of who God and Jesus really are. We hear that Jesus loves everyone and that even our sinful desires are part of how he made us. And that's simply not true. We are losing our understanding of the power of the gospel and we're limiting our knowledge of the Bible. Some terrible things happened in the Old Testament. So it's important for us to understand what has changed, if anything, the Old Testament to the New Testament when Jesus um, came to live on this earth. Today, we're going to take a trip covering thousands of years and a lot of scripture. We want to see where Jesus was throughout history. So let's buckle up and prepare ourselves and our minds and our hearts for this exciting trip. So let's start with John 1, 1 to 5, and then we'll do 10 to 14. Starting from verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was His own, but his own did not receive him. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of a natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we can see that Jesus was with God in the beginning and was involved in creation and has been involved with God all through history, even until the time he came to earth as a baby in Bethlehem. Can you imagine the creator of the universe being rejected by his own creation when he comes to seek and save the lost? He came to earth to show us and provide us a way to, to be saved from eternal destruction. A long time ago, I had the... Uh, the job to build a warehouse or a store inside a warehouse. Yes, we had major security problems where I was working, and uh, so we had this uh, two layers of security. And um, we got some birds trapped in the, the inner layer of, of security. And I remember looking at these birds and saying, how do I get them out? And I tried everything, chasing them, but they didn't know that they were not going to have food or water there, and they're going to die. And um, I tried everything. I was not able to get them out. And I realized that, you know, if I could become a bird, and go in there and know the way out, I could show them. And it dawned on me what Jesus, or part of what Jesus had done for us at the, by coming to this earth. So let's go to the beginning of Genesis and explore further. So in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. A few minutes ago, we read John 1.1, 1, 1, which places Jesus at the beginning and involved in creation. Our scripture reading this morning from Colossians also places Jesus with God the Father, even before the creation, as the firstborn of all creation. Now we see the Holy Spirit was with them in the beginning at creation. It says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So here we introduce to the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we see the complete Godhead and tr the complete Holy Trinity involved right from the beginning. Then 
The next 13 verses explain how God created the earth. God created everything by just speaking it into being, and he said it was good. So we're not going to go through all of that. You can go and read further. But we can see that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved in the creation. We're going to pick up at Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man kind in our image and in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. And in Genesis 1.31, it says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning in the sixth day. You see, God said it was very good when he made man and woman. So if we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we'll see that when God created Adam, he actually got down onto the ground and formed him out of the dust. And he breathed life into him. Script, scripture tells us that God knits us together in, in our mother's womb. If we go to Psalm 139, 13 uh, to 18, it says, for, I created, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know it full well. My frame was not hidden from you when it was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Yeah, we can see that God knows even when our lives will end before we even start. And once again, we see the Trinity at work here. Remember, he said, let us make man. So we go to Genesis 2, 15 to 17, and, and it says, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from this tree, you will certainly die. In Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals and the, that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? We as believers are challenged all the time with this. Did God really say? Did God really say that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourself? Yes, he did. Did God really say um, that he loved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one, and only one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life? He said so in John 3.16. Did God really say, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, he did in John 14, 6. Did God really say that we should honor our mother and father? Yes, he did. You get the point. In Genesis 3, 1 to 2, we carry on and it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not Certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he also ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed some fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and he hid from the Lord and among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. But he was there all along, right? He could have said no. So God goes ahead and tells Adam and Eve what the consequences are of what they have done and what it will be like living in a fallen world. They were removed from the garden 
And to this day, we all suffer the consequences of a fallen world. We can't just blame them, though, because we all sin, and that also contributes uh, to the state of the world today. But remember, in all these things, Jesus was there. So now we're going to travel about one and a half thousand years along, all the way to Genesis chapter 6, and we'll start with 5 to 8. And the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made, the hum- made human beings on this earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them all the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. We need to remember that God is a holy God. Who by his nature cannot tolerate sin. If we look at Psalm 5, uh, from f- verse 4 to 5, it says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. This verse clearly states that God does not tolerate wickedness or evil. But God is also a loving God. He wanted, not wanting anybody to perish, so he provides a way of salvation. The Bible says that Noah found favor with God In Genesis 6 verse 9, it says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And so Noah and his family were saved. Not only is this an account of what happened, but this also points forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Genesis 6 continues as God gives Noah instructions on how to build the ark. So remember, Noah was around 500 years old, and it took him somewhere between 75 and 120 years to build the ark. At this time, God was patient and and gave time for people to repent. And Noah preached to them for about 75 years. And, you know, it's similar today as we're waiting for the coming of the Lord again. God is patient. So go to Genesis 7, 13 to 16. And it says, On that very day, Noah and his son, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, together with his wives and the wives of the three, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have breath in, breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. And then it says, Then the Lord shut him in. Take note. God closed the door of the ark. He shut the ark. And God also saved all the believers of that time. There were eight of them. We carry on in Genesis 7, 7, 20 to 23. And it says, The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had breath in it. Its nostrils died. Every, th- every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those in the ark. Here we see the results of unrepentant hearts and our sovereign God's standard. And yes, Jesus was there through all of that. By some estimates, as many as 750 million people or more would have died. Men, women, and children and all the animals. Remember, people back then lived lot, a lot longer and, um, and they had a lot more children. And um, remember, only eight were saved. The ark points to the saving grace through Jesus Christ and represents the gospel and salvation. When I was 19, I had the privilege and opportunity to teach second grade Sunday school. And I was required to do some training. And there was this old lady that came and, and gave us training and she taught us that everything in the Old Testament points, and throughout the whole Bible, points to the saving grace of Jesus. She said it's as if there's a golden thread that runs through the Old Testament and the whole Bible, and everything points to to what Jesus was going to do for us on the cross. This has served me very well over the years, uh, understanding the Bible. We think of the story uh, of Noah, It's a perfect visual of God's saving grace and the consequences of not accepting him. You've got Abraham and Isaac. 
uh, God provided a ram for, for Abraham. Moses and the freeing of the Israelites. And there are many more examples where, where we see pointing to what Jesus was going to do. If we go to Genesis 9, 11 to 13, it says, I established my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for the generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God sets up a covenant or a promise that he will never again destroy us by flood. The rainbow is a reminder of what happened and God's promise and his saving grace. It's a reminder that God loves you. The Bible, Bible is full of Old Testament history showing God's sovereignty and his wrath. Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, Jericho, Moses and the Egyptian plagues. These were terrible times when God wiped out entire cities and men, women and children. And Jesus was with God the Father through all these events. The Bible says that God does not change. So now we're going to fast forward about 2,348 years. And Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And Jesus lives a sinless life. And he was God incarnate, which means God in the flesh. He came to seek and save the lost, but he was rejected by his own. We all know the story. He was eventually captured, tried and whipped and crucified. He gave up his life for us. His body was broken and bloodshed. He was buried and rose from death on the third day, conquering death and providing a way of salvation for us. Remember, this is the same Jesus that was there at creation and all through all the other events that we've spoken about. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow f to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. I hope that you can see from this journey that, and, and this verse, that God and the Holy God is a holy God, and His high standards cannot ex um, cannot cannot accept sin, and the consequences of sin are devastating. But we know John three sixteen it says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life." You know, you know what it means. It means that when, when you repent and ask Jesus into your heart, and we've looked at all the sin that God could not tolerate, but when he looks at you, he does not see that sin anymore. You are clean. The Bible says that that sin is thrown as far as the east is from the west. God doesn't even see it. He just sees you pure as, as what Jesus is, and that's because of the work of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And just as, it, just as God was patient in Noah's days, he is patient today. But his standards have not changed. Who he is has not changed. Don't misinterpret God's patience for a lowering of standards. God shut out those who did not want to have anything to do with them in the days of Noah. Hundreds of millions of people. And he will shut out those who do not want to have anything to do with him when Jesus comes again. This is really hard reality to understand. But God will not tolerate sin. We are today living in a fallen world and see severe hardships as a result of sin. We see death. We, there are people in this world who are starving. There are wars going on and good people are dying and many bad things happening. Um, this life and our struggles are only for a short while though. Um, those who repent will be reunited with Christ in heaven and given a new body. I think you've all heard it said, life is short, enjoy it. But we also got to remember, life is eternal and we need to prepare for it. The Bible's very clear what will happen when Jesus comes again. In Revelations 20, 15 it says, And if anyone's name is not found, in, found written in the book of life, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. How do we get our names in the book of life, you may ask? 
We need to repent and believe. Repent from sin by asking God to forgive, to, for forgiveness, turning away from sin, dying to our old way of self and believing that Jesus has, has died for us and we need to follow him. Well, just like in the days of Noah, God is patient. Our time is running out to repent. We need to stop listening to people in our lives who say, did God really say? Jesus, just like God, is the same Jesus of the Old Testament and the New Testament. His standards have not changed. His wrath and punishment have not changed. Nor has his love for us changed. He still loves us and has a plan for our lives. He still loves us so much that he provides a way of salvation for us. Reading our Bible, the authentic message, is a way for us ident to identify these fake messages that we hear. It's just like the only way to know what is fake money is to handle the real money. So we've got to read our Bible so we can know when people are trying to mislead us or say, did God really say? So what does the Bible say about being saved or born again? The Bible says that sin separates us from God. In Romans 3.23 it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23 it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can do nothing to remove our own sins. Ephesians 2 verse 8 it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. You cannot earn your way to salvation it is a free gift at the cross jesus did for what, for us what we could not do for ourselves he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins in 1 john 1 7 it says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin through faith we freely receive forgiveness and eternal life in Romans 6.23, again, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Accepting Jesus' free gift, we must, ex how do we, we, we must accept the gift by turning to him. In Romans 10.9, it says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's going to be a point where we no longer have the choice. When Jesus either comes for us in the clouds or calls us home before them. Both ways, we do not know the, the time or the hour. We need to repent and believe and follow Jesus. And we, then when we do that, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will, will come and live inside of us and help us to walk with Jesus. He restores our relationship with God and we can recover and pursue God's plan and design for our lives. This past week, we had a funeral here for Victoria, a lovely the young lady who died suddenly from an asthma attack. She was only 22 years old. We do not know the number of days that the Lord has given us. When Victoria was a young girl, she attended the Sunday school at our church here. And one Sunday, she repented from her sins, and she was baptized and started following Jesus. She's now absent in the body, but she's present with the Lord. Unbeliever, can you hear God calling you now to repentance? Don't hesitate to repent and believe. Tell him you're sorry and follow him. Reach out to a Christian leader here today if... Um, if you want to hear more about how to follow Jesus today. Christian, what is God saying to you this morning? Is he challenging you in your walk with him? Is he challenging you as to who you are listening to in place of spending time with him and believing his word? Make a commitment today to spend more time with him in his word. Go and join a life group today to help you with your walk with Jesus. We have a life group at our home as well on, on Tuesday evenings. But find one that works with you. There's life groups on, on Wednesdays. But we need to be studying God's word. God loves you. Let, it, let us pray. 
Father God, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you love us so much, Lord, that even though you're a sovereign God and the consequences of sin is death, Lord, we, we thank you that you provided a way for every one of us, that whoever wants can follow you and be saved. We just pray, Lord, that you'll work in our hearts, Lord, that you'll open our eyes and our ears and the, the ears of our, our hearts, Lord, that we would listen to what you're saying to us this morning and respond. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask Abdu if he won't come to the front chair. If anybody wants to come and pray with one of us, please feel free to do so.